Hello and welcome to the Community Roundtable. I'm your host, David Lyle, and tonight we're going to be speaking with uh, Republican Representative Steve Negron um, regarding a range of topics, including local here to Nashua, state, national, and if we get to it, some global topics. Sure. Steve, I want to welcome you to the show. Hello, David. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Hey, no problem. Now, Nashua is sort of a growing city. We're as you know, Mayor Donch is looking to make us a welcoming city. Sure. Uh, would you say right now it's going in the right direction, or if not, why not? If so, why? I think it is going in the right direction. You know, I've lived here since 1989, um, right after Money Magazine um, had labeled Nashville the number one city in the country to live. So that wasn't the reason I came here. I got stationed out at Hanscom Air Force Base, and I ended up just living in Nashua. And I see a lot of resurgence um, in the city. You see there's a lot of... Um, Vitality that's going downtown area. There's a lot of great opportunities that are happening in the downtown area that I think is really bringing a lot of people um, back to the city. I think that um, on the, the heels of what uh, Donnelly Lozo did and now uh, Jim Donches is doing, I think they've got the, the, the city going in the right path. Uh, we have some challenges, clearly, um, like any other city in the state of New Hampshire, but I think the, the mayor's got us going in the, in the right direction. Are there any uh, events or anything you would like to see that could help improve the city or make it more welcoming to either tourism or for people to move into the city? You know, one of the things that, and having lived, um, being retired military, and I've lived in many different states and, and around the world, one of the things that I think that we need to kind of focus on is something about uh, in the arts arena. You know, and I know that they're talking about, there was a, a discussion in the Telegraph about where Alex Shoes was previously in downtown. He's changed it into like an art center where you'd actually have some type of, um, concerts in a venue or those kind of things. And I think some of that cultural aspect, um, I think, could be brought into Nashville and beefed up a little bit. I know um, we've been listening to the symphony at the old um, high school right there on Elm Street. Um, but I think if there's some revitalization of that kind of the arts in the city, I think that would draw a lot of different, uh, different types of people to Nashua, and I think it would be beneficial to the city. Excellent. Uh, what about uh, such as programs such as the uh, Safe Stations program, stuff, stuff that's been helping uh, people with addiction fight those addictions? Do you think they're, how valuable do you think they are to the city and to the state possibly? Sure. Well, certainly the opioid issue has been an issue that's just crushing the state. It's not just us. You know, we're not in this alone. And some of our surrounding states are doing that as well. And so you see some of the things that Manchester's doing. Um, one of the things that I, that I think is important to realize is that the opioid crisis um, is, is a lot deeper than just that single individual that's taken a one-off and it's gotten some, uh, some drug that's a lot more potent than what he or she thought that it was going to be. So I think there's an ability for some of our first responders, maybe fire stations, to have a way um, that when those people do get to that point, um, that there's a place that there's, there's some readily help that's readily available. The bigger picture is, I think, is that we have to do a lot of education, as to, especially with the young kids, about what it is that actually then grabs these young men and women today. Um, and it's not just young men and women. Then there's older folks, you know, elderly folks our age um, that get um, addicted to opioids. But just an, an, an education of, of why those things um, happen so that we can start teaching the kids at a younger age that, you know, that's something that they should probably stay away from. Uh, that's a, to me, that's a great thing. I've, I've been a, since I heard about the Safe Stations program, I became a very big fan of it. Sure. Um, what about... Uh, We've got a whole lot of th whole lot happening in the city, as you know. We we had the uh, art on the street last right. year or last summer. We've got up in Concord. You saw the bicycles all over the place. Right. Uh, what would you say would be a a good strong thing that could draw people to downtown? I, you you mentioned the uh, potential of turning the Alex shoes right. into a uh, a venue, but what are other things that you feel would draw people to Nashua? Well, I like, you know, it's really funny. It was just, I think it was last year that I, that I first realized that I like the idea of the pianos on either end of Main Street, um, that someday, you know, on, on a very nice summer day or even a fall day that somebody just stops by and starts playing. I think music truly is, um, is, a, is a key to the soul. And I, and I think I like a little bit more musical kind of theme events happening downtown. Um, music, it doesn't really matter the genre of music. I think when people listen to music and they hear music, I think it, it uplifts their spirit. I think there's a lot of goodness that happens. And I think we should be able to look at some things that is just, and not, not a paid event, but maybe bring some local artists down, people that are up and coming. The high school talent in Nashville North and South and, and even Bishop Girton is amazing. Um, and there's a lot of phenomenal 
uh, young men and women that have tremendous talent. Um, and I think that would be an ability for them to showcase their talent um, to the citizens that they, they, they live and breathe with and, and have some sort of opportunity that we could showcase some of those kids downtown, I think would be very helpful to the, to the city. And what about uh, com when it comes to education? Uh, you mentioned the arts, but we're all ta what about the other STEM programs, uh, such as engineering, mechanics, sure. stuff that would help build a trade for people who don't feel like the college might be their path? Do you think it's something that the school, the school system and the city uh, should invest in? You know, that's a very good point, um, David. I was actually listening to um, uh, presidential um, hopeful Marco Rubio um, when he was still running for, for president. And one of the things he talked about is that we've gotten away from the ability to look at a trade as, as unfortunately, as a legitimate way of making a living. Uh, for whatever reason, and I don't agree with it, it's looked differently than somebody who goes to a four-year um, four institution. I absolutely believe that trade schools are important. You know, uh, welding or carpentry or plumbing, electrical. You know, this country was built on a lot of great people that had those trades. You know, not, a lot, not everybody um, actually went to four-year universities at the turn of the century, so of the 19th century. So, so you know, everybody has this idea that you have to go to a four-year school to be successful, and I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I believe that there is um, a time and a place, and I believe there are opportunities for young men and women to learn a craft, learn a trade, and, and it's not anything that should be looked upon as something less than a four-year institution, um, because really, at the end of the day, what are both individuals trying to do? is to, to have a craft that they can do, be well at, make good money at, raise a family at, um, and then give back to the community that they live in. And a tradesman is just as successful as somebody who's gone off to a four-year institution. So I believe if there is an opportunity for us to, to showcase and, and enlighten and educate people on that, on those trades that are kind of falling off the way, so I think we're very beneficial to the kids in Nashua. Do you think that some of these trades, uh, they should get that started in, in high school or just or start them off at after they graduate from high school? I think those, those individuals, and we all know who those kids are, the kid that was always very handy working on a car or somebody that could just use their hands with tools, you know, and, and fix something within the house. I believe if there's an opportunity to do it within the high school and have like a track that maybe they come out of high school and they've got some, you know, they're not a, they're, you know, they're not a tradesman yet, certainly, but they're an apprentice or maybe on to being a journeyman, that they have, you know, a path forward. You know, it, not everybody needs to go to a four-year school. You know, not everybody has that same desire. Um, and I think if there's options and availability for other kids to do other things like trades, I think it would be, it would surprise us to see how many kids would, would follow that path. So if the alderman and the mayor decide to uh, flagship a program that would highlight trade uh, trades within the city or students getting into trade programs, you'd be in support of that? Absolutely. I think, you know, high school is, is, a, is a place where kids try to find out where their boundaries are and, and some things that they, that they like. And as we can do it within um, the purview of, of the Board of Education and within the schools, and that's something that the children would, would want to do and pursue, I'm all, I'm all for it, right? Because at the end of the day, David, is it, what are we doing to help the kids get out of high school into whatever arena they want, whether it's join the military, go to a four-year institution, or become a tradesperson? You know, we, I think we owe that to the kids to give them those kind of options. Excellent. Let's move on to the, uh, I'll go a little bit more, expand a little bit more sure. from Nashua. Let's get to the state view. Sure. Uh, you've been hinting that you've been looking at running for Congress. Yes. And, uh, I think you're still on the fence on I that. I am. A decision hasn't been made. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is probably your biggest challenge towards either making that decision or do you see that you would benefit if you got if you did run for Congress? What would set you apart from the rest of the candidates if you well, did? Well, certainly the decision is a family decision. And so my wife and I, um, we have to have uh, that kind of talk. We've had many talks about it. But when you, when you decide to go down that path, it really is kind. Um, and even running a campaign, I believe it's, it's a life-altering event. Um, and so if we're going to do that kind of thing, you know, everybody's in. It's not going to be just a, a me decision because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge family man. And I believe that anything that I do certainly has to be able to, to take into consideration not only my wife but my three children. Um, even though they're, they're older, um, it, will, it will affect them as well. The second part of your question is, is why? Um, you know, I, I've learned a lot as I've gone through this first term um, in the House, but I, I, I bring a different kind of experience to, to the state. You know, I wasn't born and raised here. Um, I've seen a lot of different things in a lot of different states. I've lived overseas. So I've been able to 
to cherry pick kind of the good things that I've seen from all these different states and the places that I've lived. Um, and to try to bring that back to, to here and to really to bring back to the state of New Hampshire um, somebody that they know that is just somebody just like them, that understands the traffic on Daniel Webster, um, that knows how much a loaf of bread costs or, or eggs cost, and at the same time be able to carry a message in Washington. And, and as you and I both know, you know, it's always been um, a little disheartening sometimes to see some of the infighting that's going on down in Washington, D.C., and I necessarily don't believe that it has to be that way. I mean, we've, you know, they only have 435 representatives in the House, and we have 400. So it's not too dissimilar to what we've done. And we've done some great things in the House when it comes to bipartisanship, right? At the end of the day, we pass a bill, we go have lunch, we have dinner, we talk, you know, we come back to our communities, and we're still friends. And I think that's what's missing. And, and that's the only way I've ever been. That's the only way I've ever grown up is knowing that, you know, when you have consensus is really when you start making things happen. Okay, and you, as you know, we just recently uh, had a budget come through the uh, yes, State House and the State Senate. Yes. Um, what were your feelings on the process that that budget went through? Do you think it could have been more open? Do you think it was uh, too closed, or how do you th how do you feel the uh, it was how do you feel that it was handled? Was it as far as uh, what happened at the state house sure. when making getting it done? Right. Well, if 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 you don't know, the first time the budget came through, I was one of the sixty six as a Republicans who didn't vote for the budget, um, and then a smaller number of twenty one, I think, that didn't vote for the for HB2. And it, what I found is that I think it's, it's, it's two parts. One, it's incumbent upon me, if I want to make an informed decision, that they hold hearings, right? And if I really want to know what the, uh, the nitty gritty details are, I should make myself go to those hearings, get up behind a mic, and ask those questions of those people that are actually doing the yeoman's work and all those three finance committees and the Ways and Means Committee. Um, I think they're owed that. I think that what I found is they tried, uh, you know, when all of a sudden we get three days when a budget is, is given to us that came out uh, to the House, it, I think we, we, we did ourselves a disservice. I know I'm speaking for me personally that I didn't get involved as much as I should have, right? So then all of a sudden we have this budget and you have to do really a 30,000 foot kind of cursory level and really don't get into the weeds. Um, that was the first part. And of course, you know, it failed and then it went over to the Senate without a position from the House. What I think they did this time on the second round when it came back to us from the Senate or when the Senate held hearings, I think there was a lot more visibility into it. I think a lot more people went to the House and listened and went to the public hearings uh, on the budget. But the budget is a, is a tremendous beast, and the, the devil's in the details. So what I've learned is I believe that if I have questions, go to those people on those committees. I mean, we sit with them once a week when we go up at the House, right? Pull them aside. Every one of those persons that I've talked to uh, were eager to tell the story as to why some things were done. And I think the second time around, um, and I did vote for the budget on the second time around, is that I was more comfortable with it because I had a lot more information that I was either given or that I asked for, which put me in a better position to, to, to make a more informed uh, decision the second time. And so I think there's so much information when you're doing the budget, it's hard f to just sit back and wait. And I think it's a two-part process give us the information to make the information available to us, and then we can go and reach out to you, whether through a public hearing or one-on-one, -on -one, and sit down so that we can be the best informed house that we can for, for the governor. Do you think it started too late in the season or too early in the season, or do you think when do you think it would be a good time yeah, for them in you the know, future? I, I think, quite frankly, and just, just this experience that I have, I think it would be better if the governor, and I don't, don't understand what his timetables are to release in the budget to, to the house originally, right? I think that any time you have a little bit more time to assess some things, it gives you a little bit more time. I mean, you can get uh, what I call paralysis by analysis, which means you just keep on thinking about something so long that you really just can't get out of your way. But maybe a couple of weeks more that we would have more time to have uh, a little more time to digest the budget. But I don't know what constraints the governor has when he has to release it to us. If there's a way to wicker that so that, you know, he gets elected, and that's the first thing he does, right? He starts figuring out, how do I get this budget over to the House? Because that's really going to be his first pillar of his administration. So if there's a way to get it to us a little bit earlier, I think it would be beneficial to all parties. And do you think uh, there's uh, been some talk occasionally of reworking how the uh, how our representatives, such as our, the governors, the executive counselors, senators, and such, are elected? Do you think the way we have it right now, where everybody gets elected every other year, is good? Or do you think 
it could use some improvements or what changes would you make if you had the opportunity? Sure. Um, you know, I haven't really thought much about that, David, but, you know, every time you have a wholesale change every two years, you know, everybody, ha for those that are incumbents, it's not a, not a big deal, right? Because, you know, they know they know the ropes a little bit. But if there's a wholesale change that comes up there and you have, like, a brand new governor and, then like, an overturn of the Senate and an overturn of the House and you have a lot more people in there, I think you have a slow startup time. Um, and I think maybe that's kind of, uh, could be a little bit of a hindrance. But I, I like the fact that, um, and how we elect our representatives. I, I kind of like that we do it every two years. Certainly, you, you know, some people have thought, and we've talked about, you split it in half and it's every every other year, you know, so that you always have people that are incumbents already in there. Maintaining and, institutional memory. I, absolutely. You know, um, I I guess there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's pros and cons to that as well. Um, my only experience is this time, you know, so I enjoyed all the incoming freshmen. You know, it was kind of like thrown into the, you and I both, you know, thrown into the, the wicket all at one time. You know, we're all learning together. Um, so that, that was an interesting concept. But maybe maybe we look at something that staggers some of it. But I, I would, wouldn't know whether that's half or a third or whatever. Then you have to figure out, you know, for that transition period, is somebody going to be in the house longer than the two years that they're there? So, you know, I think it's an interesting topic um, that I think we should discuss at some point. Okay. Um, keeping in keeping in the... Uh in the state house, you're on the election law committee. Yes, sir. Uh, the committee just approved a new uh, new rules to the election. Yes. To polling places in the and when right. people can register for elections. Right. Uh, do you see any? Do you are you happy with the way it came out, or do you think it could have been? Or what would you have changed if you had the opportunity? Well, you know, certainly, I mean, and there's a lot of, and I've learned a lot. Um, and we have a tremendous individual in Secretary Gardner. Um, who, as you know, is the senior statesman when it comes to, to the secretaries of the 50 states. Um, what, I, what, I, what I found is that because you had uh, HAVA, the Help America Vote Act, um, and then you had what was called Motor Voter, you had a lot of things that were out there that, that we made decisions as a state that put us in a situation that, that prior to this session that you potentially could have somebody who didn't have to show any form of documentation, didn't show any form of domicile, citizenship, or anything like that, and could be able to cast a vote. So what we did this year with Senate Bill 3, which was the bill that came over from, uh, uh, from the Senate, was we still will allow same-day registration. Right? But what the little nuance difference is now is that within 10 days, then the, the people that ran the elections have an ability to look up public records to find out, yeah, you know what? David is who he said he is. All right, so that's good. So he's now on the scrolls. We also have an opportunity to, to just throw that over to the Secretary of State, which there was a position funded in this budget to be able to go and try and do some sort of um, investigation, not from a criminal perspective, but just to find out, is that person someone who they said they were? Um, and we also have the, the ability to go um, either through um, a, a, a county um, official a city official to go on that residence that that person put down on that on that form and see if, if they if they are who they say they are so and if they're not then now we then remove them from the scrolls and so now we have at least a data point to say okay this person never came back to show that he or she was in fact who they said they were and now the next time the next election we now can be on the lookout for maybe he tries or she tries to do something like that again um, the, the thing that I've learned is that there's no perfect system, right? Uh, because we allow same-day registration, it opens up some, some issues that we've dealt with. Um, if, if I could do something different, I, I don't know how I would be able to put something in place that doesn't violate a U.S. Supreme Court ruling, um, you know, that doesn't um, look at a, uh, an individual as a different class of citizen. Like, you know, some people were saying that, you know, we... Uh, we were trying to uh, not allow college students to vote, you know, which was really never the case. Um, college students absolutely can vote. You know, the Supreme Court has said that where they're residing in their dorm is their domicile, so they can they can vote. That doesn't mean they can vote absentee from the state that they came from, right? But they can absolutely vote in the state of New Hampshire. So, would you support a bill that uh, that would allow them to register to vote at their local school since they would have all the domicile information? Um, that's me personally, I think that you, there's only one state you can belong to, 
right, either. If you want to register and be a domicile in the state of New Hampshire, then that's your state, right? It's not another state that you came in from. So, so the, re the really funny thing is, David, there's three things in our Constitution that says you need to vote, right? You need to be a U.S. citizen, you need to be over 20, uh, you need to be over 18, and you need to be domiciled here in the state. As long as you meet those three, in whatever manner you meet those, I'm good with that, right? That's really what the intent is. The trick is, is that very easy for us to find out if you're a citizen. Well, it should be easy, right? Very easy for us to find out if you're over 18. It should be easy. The tricky one is what, what is domicile? And that's what we had. We had almost eight hours of public hearing on that one issue, which was uh, Senator Birdsall's Senate Bill 3 about domicile. So, you know, if he's here for nine months and then over there for three, you know, is that really domicile? And so that was really the point. And I think we came to a good compromise. Um, it isn't perfect necessarily, but it allows um, college students, and we know even, even in the law, we never say student because we're really looking at them as either you're a domicile resident of the state or not, regardless of your status, if you're a student or not. So I think we did the best thing that we could. I think it's, uh, as I used to tell my election law colleagues, you know, you can't boil the ocean. Right? You can't fix every problem with one bill, right? So let's just figure out um, uh, if we're doing the right thing. And, and it was a partisan vote. Um, to be be totally honest with you, um, but I think it's something that that has made it a little bit more uh, definitive as to who is able to vote in our state. So, and you know that the uh, motor voter uh, exception we get to not having to comply with it is because of the same day Absolutely. registration. Absolutely. So, do you think that uh, maintaining that same day registration is a good thing, or do you think we should? Uh, do away with it and create the central election process. Well, it's that. funny because when we actually heard a lot from both um, the Secretary of State um, and uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, if you do away with same-day registration, you know, it's out of the frying pan into the fire, right? There's a lot more things that are out there that probably are more gotchas if you get rid of same-day registration. So, you know, it is what we have in the state. Um, I, like I said, it's not perfect. I. I can live with the fact that we can do same-day registration. My only issue is that, you know, there are legitimate reasons why you're a same-day registrant. Uh, me personally, you know, you've got 300 other days to register, you know, if voting is, is that important to you. Um, and if you do that, I mean, there's a whole different way to vote. Go down to the clerk or whatever, and you vote normally, you know, bring documentation, and then, then there's no question. It's just that same-day registration. And, you know, I have colleagues in other states that aren't same-day registrants, and they're, they're, like, shake their head, like, oh, how do you do that? So we have a very good dialogue. And we say we do that because, you know, we don't have to comply with the motor voter law. So this is how we, how we deal with it. And, and it's, it's working. I believe um, it's, there are some things that slip through the crack. I still believe that there are some people that voted that, that shouldn't have. Numbers I won't get into because I don't know. Um, and as I talk to, uh, to people at the well, you know, unless you actually investigate and prosecute, you really don't know if voter fraud ever really happened. Um, but we have um, anecdotal evidence that, you know, that there, there are some things that are out there. So we just, we just want to make sure that whatever the integrity of the vote is in our state, for those of us who live in that state, is as, as pristine as we can possibly make it. Well, that, that's, that's actually uh, something that a lot of people probably are thinking about. Me personally, I don't mind same-day registration because it's, made, a, it's made, made my life a little bit easier sure. because uh, – when I move every once in a while, going to school or such. Uh, now, in some states, uh, you may have noticed the uh, you have outside organizations that are helping to register voters, right. but here uh, we don't have That's that. Correct. Um, is it something that you think is a liability for those states, or do you think it's something that can help benefit uh, getting people registered and aware of the vote? In, in some of the literature that I've read and some of the articles, you know, I think that having outside entities come into your state to help you register, I think, has shown to be a hindrance. Um, and because really, all they, you really don't know necessarily that, that the, the person is just registering you. You know, do they take those forms back to the registrar? Does it go back to the clerk? Or, you know, those kind of things is really, is, there's, there's an inherent belief and trust that those entities that are getting those registrations are, in fact, doing so. And then you, if you register, how do you know that that's in fact actually gone through all the wickets and now you're actually on the scroll so that you can go and vote on that day? Um, in our state, you know personally that you've registered to vote. And I think that's what's, the, that, that's what's important. The fact that I would 
leave that up to somebody because I just fill out a piece of paper. They walk around malls, they walk around, you know, and they, they find people and they've registered. No, well, let's register you now. You know, how do I really know that that information is actually getting back? And then say, and it's happened that you go to register, you go to vote, excuse me, and you're not, you're not there on the, on the scroll. So, you know, I, I think that it's your responsibility um, to register to vote. Um, it's your constitutional right to vote. So I think it's better if, if you take that on as a individual responsibility and go do it yourself. Okay. Now we're going to move on to a more national level. So sure. we're going to leave the state of New Hampshire a little Bye. bit. <laughs> um, when looking at uh, the way the country is going, uh, we've had right now we we seem to be extremely divided. Yes, and sir. What do you think would be we can do to try and ease that divide to bring statesmanship back to Congress, back to the Senate, back to even to the White House, so that people can have that trust in their government again? Absolutely. You know, it's very funny, Dave, because this, this today at lunch I was having a, this very very discussion, not knowing that you were going to bring up this question. Um, with a, a, a very uh, esteemed colleague of mine and a very close friend. And, you know, we were talking about that, that topic, and, and, and I, I questioned, you know, why are there some people still angry? And I think that's, that's part of what it is. You know, um, I haven't always won. Uh, my presidential ballot hasn't always gone to the winner. But at the end of the day, that's my president. And, and as a country, you know, we, we voted, we could get into the issue, which we talk, I talked about at the well about the Electoral College and the popular vote, which is a, a, a topic for, for, another topic for discussion. But not, not everybody gets everything they want. And I think there's just some fear that all of a sudden our country elected somebody who wasn't institutional, who wasn't somebody who had either come up through the ranks or who what we were comfortable with. Uh, myself included. So you see, a, you see a businessman that came through that, in my opinion, you know, wasn't really the traditional political figure, and so everything he's doing is a scrutinized, and b is a little bit different than than what we were used to. I mean, we can just take tweeting for example, right? I, I'm not so sure any of his predecessors really were as uh, adept at tweeting as as President Trump is. So he starts doing things through that way, which kind of bypasses traditional channels of information and because it's new to us we're a little a uncomfortable with it and and b you know it can we question it can can he be doing that i mean can the president have a twitter account well it's all new to us and so i and i, and I think that there was there's there was a lot of it was a very divisive race as you well know um leading up to to the election and i think some of that just just boiled over so my my i guess my answer is how do we get back to a point? I think at the, I think what you need to do is is be honest and open, right? With without any fear of somebody coming at you and taking advantage of a statement that you made. I think we're very guarded. I think people in Washington are afraid to say what they really feel. For a, what is their caucus going to say about something that they said? What do you mean you agree with the Democrat? Or what do you mean you agree with the Republican? You're not supposed to do that. And the the, the reality is why not? I mean. We're probably more, we have more in common than we have, uh, that, that we don't have in common. I really believe that. It's, it's funny, I'll tell you a quick story. I was uh, at the, uh, the general in November. I was at the polling station at Ward 5, and this young girl, it was probably 7 o'clock, she was with her mom. She walked out, and she asked her mom if she could come talk to me. Right? I was one of the candidates. She came up to me, and she goes, can I ask you a question? I said, absolutely. She goes, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I said, well, I'm a registered Republican, but... But that doesn't mean that I have all the answers. I mean, I have some great friends that are a different political affiliation, but they're smart. They have great ideas. And so, you know, we try to, we, if you take two smart people, you're going to get a best of breed answer. But once we become divisive and we put up these walls, then we're really only dealing with half a deck. And she asked me something. She goes, you mean we don't do that? Like, no, hon, we don't. So. I think we have to get to a point where, you know, you see some of these people that get behind the mic, and it really is less about the issue than it is about position, uh, a position of them of, of stonewalling somebody else or a position of them as a senior member of their party in uh, a house. Um, and and I, think we, I think Americans are just tired of just, it seems like it's a boxing match every time you turn on the television. And it, and it doesn't, it, it wasn't always that way, you know. 
the, the example I use is President Reagan and uh, Speaker Tip O'Neill. Completely sides of the aisle, complete opposites, but they got more work done because they were able to put those differences away and what was the best decision to move the country forward. And so, you know, they had dinners together, they had lunches together, and I think that's what we need to get back to. And I think as long as, as we keep on sending people to Washington, and not just from New Hampshire, but across the country, that have bought into that rhetoric, that believes that they need to perpetuate that, you know, you know, David, I gotta just tell you, I don't like you just because you're a Democrat. I think is a disservice, not only to each other, but for the people that voted us to send us to Washington, right? Because that's the government of the people. It's not the government of the Democrats and the government of the Republicans or the independents. It's the government of the people, and we need to start acting accordingly. So do you think we should have, like, an op on a national level, an open election where parties don't, don't matter from the, be from the beginning? There's no real Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green. There's no parties. They're just uh, the top two people uh, in that district or get on the ballot no matter what, what their political affiliation might be? Sure. Well, that's interesting, right? I mean, if you based a decision on the merits of, of an argument, Right, or of a position on a certain topic, and let two people try to persuade the people that are voting for you, you know, what they believe is the best way to approach that, that decision. And I think people are, you know, by virtue of me wearing red or you wearing blue, that you know they have a preconceived position on, on something. And there are some things I believe that you know that there are there are inherent differences, and I get that. Uh, but some people just are in that camp, and 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 I think if you come out of your trench a little bit and I come out of my trench a little bit and maybe we wave a flag and we meet in the middle and we talk and we go back and we say, you know what, that's, that, that's not a bad idea. You know, let's at least try to socialize that, right? And maybe maybe there is some, some goodness to that. I think it, it would go far. I don't know if we'd ever get rid of the party system. I think that's just kind of entrenched in our, in our DNA. But if you've made a decision based on, on a potential candidate's approach to a, to a topic, I think that's really the basis of why you should vote for somebody. Now, with regard, regarding the uh, Senate health care bill that, just came, that right. just came out, and I heard, I know that you probably also read the uh, news as being, the votes being delayed on sure. it. Sure. What is your, would you say, your opinion on the bill? How, how would, how would you, how do you think it stacks up to the Affordable Care Act or to the House bill? Sure. Um, I'll plead a little bit ignorance, you know, I'm not as well versed as what's coming out of the Senate, but, but it's very telling that, that our um, Mitch McConnell, Senator McConnell, has to delay a vote, right, because I know he has some work within the party, right, to be able to, to, to get those votes that he has. And, and, and I think that's a good thing, right? You know, you don't want, if you know you're going to fail, and maybe there's some legitimate reasons that some of your people that are within your party are questioning it, let's find out what those are, let's address them, and figure out if there's a way that we can modify that so that we can have consensus within within the party. And we both know that this is going to be a party vote um, for the most part um, for the for the health care. Um, I'm not a big fan of of uh, of a of a government that provides health care um, to everybody as as a as a right. What I do believe in is that I do believe in the free market. I, I truly believe that as a small business owner. I believe that you know if if we we need to look at what are the regulations we have on those industries that provide care, right? What are the things that are governing them that's precluding them from doing some of the things that maybe they want to do? You know, I and I don't want to sound too naive, but if there is a provider in Idaho that meets the needs of my family, I should be able to contract with that individual in Idaho to provide me health care in whatever state I live, right? I think when we put constraints and we put boundaries on what people can and can't do, I think it becomes um, very challenging to be able, because not there isn't one size fits all. I mean, we, we know that. But what are the abilities for, for, for that kind of industry, for the healthcare industry, to give people options to do those kind of things? And maybe what the government's role is, is to provide a framework to allow those, those entities to provide that kind of, that, that kind of work. Um, you know, prior to Obamacare uh, or the Affordable Care Act, you know, the, the whole issue of, you know, you can't be insured if you had a pre-existing condition, right? I mean, some of those things kind of made me toss and turn a little bit at night. You know, how can I deny health coverage for somebody that has that? But on the same, on the same token, if, if, if as a risk factor, if I'm going to bring somebody on board, 
then maybe I need to be able to, to, to manage what my rate's going to be if somebody does have a potential pre-existing condition or a documented pre-existing condition. But I think what we need to do is to, to see where all these industries and, and somehow regulate them, right? Because you don't want somebody just running off and just doing a disservice to the very people they're supposed to be providing service to and figure out how we can do that. And I, and I think that, and, and again, not having gone into this new health care bill that came out of the Senate, I don't think that's what the structure is. But I think, you know, if, if you allow industries to be able to provide the best possible product and to give me as a consumer an opportunity to pick wherever I want to go, I think that's probably the best way to go. Now, you had mentioned uh, that Sen uh, Senator McConnell working with within his party. Uh, what about uh, possibly having him uh, reach across the aisle to Senator Schumer or, an, or, or other Democrats on, that com on the committee to uh, get their input and maybe potentially uh, find, the ha find the uncomfortable medium between Absolutely. the health you know, bill? You know, I, I think is, you know, when you see, and again, this goes back to the original question I think that you talked about um, early in the segment, is we, as soon as somebody puts something forward, you know, we all heard it as soon, you know, they, everything the Republicans tried to do was to kill the Affordable Care Act, right? Now everybody, now, now it's flipped, right? Now everything that the Democrats are trying to do is trying to kill this new health bill. To your point is exactly right. They're smart people. You know, maybe there's an area that they have a great idea, but we put up these arbitrary walls that we refuse to listen to somebody who may, just because of, of what party they're affiliated with, and I think that's wrong. And I think the people who suffer because of that, David, are the, are, is the American public, right? Because that's that little battle that you see all the time, right? So um, Senator McConnell, you know, he digs his heel in, and Senator Schumer, he digs his heel in, and nobody's going to go anywhere, right? And I think if there was an ability for us to reach consensus, then I think, A, it would be a better bill, and, and B, the, the, the people of the United States would say, oh, my gosh, look, look. We really can have, excuse me, consensus in trying to make good laws for the state. It isn't a Republican law, and it's not a Democrat law. It's supposed to be a law of the land. It's supposed to be a law that benefits everybody. American as much law. Go figure, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, as the, right now there's talk about uh, Puerto Rico, only a, a small percentage of their people vo came out to vote right. and uh, ended up voting uh, for us that 22% about. Uh, came out voting for statehood. Right. Uh, do you think that that's going to go anywhere in Congress, or do you think uh, that they're going to have to try again in uh, a year or two? Well, it's funny. Um, it's funny. I'm from Puerto Rico, um, and so having having grown up and, and having family back there, you know, there's three factions in the island, right? So you have the independents um, that that just want to break away and just be their own island in the Caribbean. That's going to be a difficult, in my opinion, it's going to be a very difficult task because you have to be able to stand up with your own kind of um, inherent um, national product um, in, the, in, in the island. Um, then you have the folks that want to be uh, a state, right? That's going to take a congressional uh, a change to the, to, you know, to, to, uh, through Congress. And, and I don't think that the states are ready to bring on a 51st state. I just, I just don't. Um, there's a lot of things about socioeconomic issues. There's about... Um, per capita income kind of issues, who gets most of the federal dollars, you know, if I bring on a state. And Puerto Rico is in a very bad place right now um, when it comes to some of the, the budget issues with the island. Um, so I'm not so sure that, that it would stand the test of, of, of a statehood um, right now. And then, of course, the third party is, you know, let's stay the way we are. You know, we don't have a representative, but we do have a governor um, in the House. He, he doesn't vote. Uh, we are U.S. citizens. So it's really this, this hybrid of, of, of a commonwealth that we have in the island. And, and I think right now, you know, we, it's always nice to know that I have Big Brother, which is the United States, right? Um, so any, any one of those things kind of upsets that apple cart, but Puerto Rico itself has to look internally and figure out what they need to do um, to, to right the ship, and it's not, an, it's not an easy problem. The problem didn't happen overnight, so the fix is not going to happen overnight, um, but they have to make some hard decisions uh, within the island on what they need to do to go forward. Okay. On uh, uh, speaking of islands yes. and such, let's move a little bit, a uh, little bit into the ocean, and we're going to move up to a global. Sure. And one of the topics that came out recently was talking about uh, the uh, evolution of our adjustment to the trade uh, negotiations with Cuba. Do you think that 
uh, where we were going in the right track, or where, where do you think would be the place to be so that if, let's say, you wanted to go visit Havana, you wouldn't have to go and get special permission from uh, from the Secretary of State's office or from right. wherever you would, or the Immigration Office to go visit. What would you say would be the best place for that? It's funny to me, that my nephew, uh, Matt, just on Facebook, about a month and a half ago, I see this picture up and he's riding on a donkey with a cigar in his mouth in these red, white, and blue shorts, and he's in Cuba. He's a college student that goes um, to college in, uh, in Connecticut, in Hartford, at Trinity College. And uh, he had a blast. Absolutely had a blast in Cuba. I think the issue is, I think things were going in the right direction, but there's, there's an entity in Cuba that is still, in my opinion, a holdover um, from Fidel, right, and, which is his brother. And, and I think that, you know, part of what we need to do is always look to, be, to open up that, that kind of exchange like, um, like we have had. Um, but politically, you know, there, there's still some remnants of that stuff. And I think we have a major issue of, of what and how they treated the, um, the Cuban people um, that were there, which is why we had all these sanctions from President Kennedy on. I mean, so th those are one of the things that happened. Um, I believe Cuba is, is an island in dire need of, of an infusion of, of new people people from the states. As you well know, there's this massive exodus of people from Cuba to Florida. You know, you have Little Havana in, um, in Florida. Kind of like reverse tourism. In, in, in a sense. And, and, and I think that it, it's a good thing. I think it's always a plus when you try to normalize relations um, with, a, with any country. Um, but I think it was, it was too soon uh, to open up as wide as we did. I think maybe we started opening up the aperture a little bit by little bit. Um, and not that everything's hunky-dory and everything's fine. Because there's still, in my opinion, and I've never been to Cuba, even though I've known a lot of uh, colleagues that are Cuban um, that actually did defect from Cuba and over, and the oppression that was there under the Fidel Castro regime is is pretty shocking. Um, and I think there's still some of, of the remnants that are that are there, and I think we need to address some of those as well as as opening up the island to tourism, those kinds of things. You know, what about uh, going over the pond to, off to Europe? How things are going in there, do you think that we're still uh, a leader here, or do you think they're starting to take more of a leading role in the, in the global economy? I, um, being a, a former military guy and being a young man who grew up in Europe, I lived in Spain for seven years, um, I still think that we're, we're the, the big player in the global scale. I really do. Um, I think what we're finding in Europe, and when I lived over in Europe, certainly it was, it was a lot different. I think you see a lot of, a lot of things that are happening that we're – we're raising a little eyebrow over. You know, I think when you lose a little bit of control as to um, what your country or who your country is or what your country looks like, I think that that, that is kind of a wake-up call to a lot of people. And we see a lot of things that's happening in Germany, happening in France, happening in England. So I think the United States, is, it was a little bit of a wake-up call for us. You know, even though we are a country of immigrants, clearly, uh, my father or my grandfather was an immigrant from Mexico. So... I understand that, and I and I uh, support that wholly. But what we're seeing in Europe is, you know, sometimes that can get away from you. And um, and they and I think a lot of times when 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 it gets the darkest, I think they still look 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 west. They look to the United States um, for either help, guidance, um, money, uh, troops, whatever the case may be. So I still think uh, that the United States is still the the main player in, in the world stage as it as it pertains to Europe. And how about uh, if you look at the, our global economy, and uh, we seem to be, we seem to have advanced far beyond most of most of the world. Most most developing nations, they don't, they're still starting to get stuff like paved roads. Sure. Uh, the infrastructure really isn't in place for most developed nations. Right. Uh, do you think that we maybe we advance too quickly so that? With this new balancing in global economy, we're having to fall back on, uh, or are we are we challenging the rest of the world to say, look where we are, come, if you want to step in our ring, you have to step up to the plate. Well, that, that's a very good question. You know, this whole global economy, you know, is now everybody lives on a on a postage stamp, right? There was a time that there were natural barriers to those kind of economies. There was oceans, clearly, right? So now that, that now that everybody's connected 
and now that there's this ability for, for everybody to see what everybody else is doing, I think that that global term has, has shrunk. And so now I can look over the fence and see what you're doing in your backyard, right? Where we didn't have that ability or that ability didn't exist 50 years ago, right? So I know now I think that, you know, when, when we have to compete on a global stage, it all gets down to a lot of things that everybody talks about, and it's, and it's the monetary issue, right? People can make as good um, things and make it cheaper because they don't pay the same wages that we do. And so we have to, when we have to compete on that kind of economy, you know, we have to be very cognizant of, of what our competitors are doing. It's the same thing if somebody did it within the United States and you have to look at what's my competitive advantage, right, versus, you know, many people make refrigerators, but what makes mine better than somebody else's? So I think in the global scale, we need to be very, very cautious about some of the countries that are catching up and have passed us in many respects in, in, in some areas of, um, of the global scale. And we need to make sure that we don't, we don't find ourselves too far in arrears. I still think that we make technological breakthroughs um, at a pace um, that's still commensurate with who we are as the United States. But it doesn't mean that people haven't caught up to us. Um, and in some cases, and specifically in some uh, unique um, areas that they may have passed us too. So, you know, that broad global economy is something that is a new dynamic that we now, we're in it, we can't get out of it, um, but we have to make sure that trade deals are, are good for the country, um, that it's a, it's, a, it's a good offering for both um, what the offer is and what the acceptance is. And so, you know, and now it's going to take a different kind of mindset for us to compete in that kind of global economy. Okay. Uh, well, we're... So you you think that basically we, we might as we should just stay the course on the in our our path of evolving technology. I do, I, I, I do, and I think you know quite frankly, you know our our STEM ability. When you look at when I was working at, for a large defense corporation um, early on in my career after I retired from the Air Force, most it was surprising that most of the people that were there on the engineering side were non American, and it raised my eyebrow a little bit. I'm like, well, why? Why is that? It's because I think some of the education um, aspects here in the States is that we've fallen behind by teaching those things like STEM. You know, and I think we need to reinvigorate that. We need to, if we're going to compete at that global level, if we're going to compete on that stage, then we have to make sure that we are still turning out some of the youngest and the brightest um, and not have to um, hire them to come back here into, into our country. Um, so I think that part of what you see was this lapse, I think, of, of that kind of focus and that kind of Part of the curriculum, and I think that's something that has to come back so that we can maintain our viability in the world global scale. Now, as you were mentioned, starting to mention education. Yes. Um, one thing I know I experienced when I was uh, in my grad school and in my undergrad, we had a lot of uh, international students. Yes. Uh, do you th uh, do you believe that they should be offered a uh, conditional citizenship or at least a uh, probationary citizenship? when they graduate from our schools as an incentive to stay in our country? Because as I noticed, many of them, as soon as they graduated, within 24, 48 hours, they were on a plane back to their home country, whereas we, we invested three, four, six years in them. And uh, they, instead of staying here, they left. Sure. What do you think we could do to help encourage them to stay? Well, I think if there is, and I'm sure there are programs out there that I'm not, that I'm aware of, um, but if somebody goes to a four-year institution or stays for two more years and gets a, a you know, a postgraduate degree, um, and they want to stay and they want to work, I'm sure that there, and they, and they want to become a citizen, if that's what their end goal is, then then I believe that there should be some sort of process by which they say, okay, you, you're here on a whatever work temporary thing that you're doing here, but at the same time, parallel, you're, you're doing the process to become a citizen, right? So that there's an end goal for them, that they know that as long as they're engaged and as long as they're um, contributing and as long as they're doing the process into becoming a U.S. citizen, then I think there, has to, there, there might be ways for us to be able to help those students stay in the country so that our, our education, which they benefited from, doesn't leave, right? That it stays here within the states and that we have, we have a path and there's metrics and there's checkpoints to make sure that they're, they're fulfilling that obligation to become a U.S. citizen. And at the same time, they're engaged, they're working, they're productive members of, of, of our country. And, and at some point in time, they'll raise their right hand and take, and take an oath. 
and now they're full-fledged U.S. citizens. So I believe that there, there probably could be some sort of program that we allow those kind of things. The trick is is that um, it, it's it's got to be it's got to be measured, right? It's got to be monitored so that if for some reason they stop working, they get fired, then then those uh, tenants that we put in place for them to be able to stay and to do the things that they wanted gets gets reviewed and they either say, hey, guess what? You know, the reason why we allowed you to stay is that you were working for company X Y Z, and at the same time you were following the path of citizenship. You're no longer working for X Y Z. Where are we here? And if you're not continuing on this path, then that's a different discussion that we're going to have to have with that with do, that student. Do you think it should start when they get issued that student visa to start to be a student, or 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 after they graduate? No, you know, because you know we have we have people that go overseas to study as well, right? So we have American citizens that go over to the University of Dublin um, to go to go study. They don't ask them to become Irish citizens, you know, at that point. Um, but they do know that they're not going to be able to stay there because those rules in that country says that after you finish your education, either you then try and get employment here, and then there's another wicket, just like the one I was explaining, or you come back, right? So I think students can come here um, as a student, but when they graduate, it kind of turns their different category of now individual. They're no longer in, in school. And how, we, how do we deal with that? And, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, what can we do to incentivize them to stay and to work here? But at the same time, you know, that's not an indefinite um, activity. There's got to be a path alongside of it where, it's where they can be leading the way towards and accomplishing their, their, their path to citizenship. All right. Well, looks like we're almost out of time. Okay. So I want to, Steve, I want to thank you for, for being here today. David, thank you so uh, much. As, as you know, we've got uh, some great stuff happening this year. We got the city elections. Yep. And I just want to shout out to uh, the viewers to let them know that you should get down to the city's clerk's office uh, any weekday you can or as soon as you can. If you're not registered to vote, vote. If you are registered to vo vote undecided during the previous election but you forgot to change yourself back to undecided, make sure you get down to vote. And we look forward to seeing you next month. I do want to thank you for your time. Steve, again, I want to thank you. Thank you, And David. have a great day, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the summer.